How's it going, guys? Past level question, renal step one, internal medicine, surgery 2CK. 26-year-old man, sustains a gunshot wound to the abdomen, blood pressure 70 on 40, receives eight packs for IVCs during surgery, is stabilized. Two days later in ICU, he develops oliguria. Oliguria will just reflect general renal failure slash insufficiency, but this is a very buzzy, easy, past level diagnosis here, okay? So let's just hop through what's most likely to be seen. Should I say decrease serum phosphate around fucking answer? Even if you don't know what's going on, you're never going to select low phosphate in renal failure. It's always going to be increased. Now, of course, this is acute renal failure. In the setting of chronic renal failure, where the kidney can't synthesize active vitamin D3, some students will say, yeah, but shouldn't phosphate be low if the kidney can't make D3? The answer is, it sounds confusing, yes, but what you need to remember is that the renal failure always wins over the vitamin D deficiency. So in renal failure, you're gonna select high phosphate and you're gonna select low calcium. I'll explain the calcium as we move through the question. Point is, wrong fucking answer. Choice B, decreased serum potassium, wrong fucking answer. So you're always gonna select increased potassium in renal failure, okay? So the kidney can't filter it, but also we secrete it distally, the cortical collecting duct under the action of aldosterone. So the way you can think about it is, what does the kidney normally do to potassium? It normally functions to get rid of it, okay? It's a lengthy discussion as far as the PCT will reabsorb basically everything, including potassium, but when we think about specialized functions more distally in the kidney after the PCT, what does the kidney do? It tries to get rid of potassium. So if we can't do that, potassium is going to be high. Choice B, wrong fucking answer. Choice C, fractional excretion of sodium greater than 1%, correct answer. Diagnosis is acute tubular necrosis, which is immediately going to get some students emotional because this is not pre-renal. I've harped on this in my renal PDF, which I'll link below, okay, and I've made other YouTube clips on this that you would think that, well, if there's decreased blood flow to the kidney, isn't that pre-renal azotemia? Pre-renal azotemia tends to occur more subacute to chronically. It can be general dehydration, vomiting over a few days. It can be chronic NSAID use. It can be diuretic use. It can be uh, chronic congestive heart failure, okay? But when we talk about acute drop in perfusion of the kidney, such as a 30-second episode of ventricular fibrillation, then the patient is defibrillated, or we have loss of blood during surgery, or during an exsanguination for a stab wound or gunshot wound, and then the patient is resuscitated, holy shit, that's acute tubular necrosis, not pre-renal. The reason is because the PCT, and this is high in and of itself, the last questions on this, the PCT is most susceptible to anoxic injury because of the high concentration of ATPase pumps that have high oxygen demand. So prior to the necrosis and sloughing of the renal tubules, they want you to know cellular swelling occurs because those ATPase pumps aren't working the way they're supposed to. Some students will ask about the medulla of the kidney, the, the pyramids of the kidney that receive uh, lesser blood flow. But when they ask about which part of the kidney is most susceptible to anoxic or hypoxic injury, you're going to select the PCT. It's on the NBME, okay? So once again, if you have decreased perfusion of the kidney in the acute setting, loss of blood flow, okay? Arrhythmia or exsanguination, you're going to choose ATN, which is fractional excretion of sodium greater than 1%, BU endocrine ratio under 20. You need to know that pre-renal azotemia, in contrast, is going to be FENA under 1%, BU end to cratting ratio over 20. Now, the reason those numbers are the way they are is because in pre-renal azotemia, when you have subacute to chronic decreased perfusion to the kidney, you're going to have the kidney attempting to reabsorb more water to compensate. And the way it accomplishes that is by reabsorbing sodium and urea, which water follows. If you're pulling sodium out of the urine, you're going to have less sodium in the urine, your phena would be under 1%. If you're pulling urea out of the urine, blood urea nitrogen would be elevated, which is why your BU endocrine ratio is high. It's greater than 20. Now, when we talk about 
calcium here. Calcium is always going to be low in renal failure if you're going to choose. Okay. Now in acute renal failure, it could be as simple as the kidney simply can't reabsorb it in the late DCT. In the setting of chronic renal failure, the salient mechanism is that you can't synthesize active vitamin D and they're going to want decrease intestinal absorption as the answer. Okay. So they'll give you chronic renal failure and you need to know that the 1-alpha hydroxylase isn't active the way it's supposed to be in the PCT. You can't make active vitamin D. What does vitamin D normally do? It goes to the small bowel, increase absorption of calcium. So they'll just have decreased intestinal absorption of calcium as the answer, okay, even though it's renal failure. Choice D, wrong fucking answer. Choice C, the unicranial ratio greater than 20, wrong fucking answer, as I just harped on. This would be pre-renal and in the setting of acute drop in perfusion of the kidney. It's going to be intrarenal, which is less than 20. Okay, so intra and postrenal are less than 20 for B unicranial ratio. Wrong fucking answer. You know the deal. I'm going to make more content. Like my stuff, subscribe my channel. Appreciate your time. That's it.